<laughs> hey guys, how you doing? It's Andrew Fazekas, the Night Sky Guy. Welcome to another edition of the Night Sky this week for November 16th, 2020. I've got the chat room open, see everyone coming in. Uh, we got Jenny from San Antonio, uh, Joe's there, uh, Jan from Indiana, hello. And we've got Shelly from West Virginia, uh, this is great. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are around the world. Uh, please do chime in. Uh, Jan, it's your birthday. Happy stellar birthday. Congrats on another trip around the sun. You did it. <laughs> and we go around once again, right? So this week, oh my gosh, we've got a jam-packed week of things in the night sky. Uh, a lot of things coming up. Uh, first off, uh, of course, the Leonid meteor shower. Have you heard of this this uh, beautiful sky show before? It's it's uh, not in uh, you know it's it's often on in terms of performance when it comes to meteor showers. Uh, the Leonids are an an annual event. It's every November, so, you know, peaking around the sixteenth, seventeenth of November. So really, uh, tonight into tomorrow morning, Monday night into Tuesday morning. But, you know, if you're watching later in the week and you're watching this archived, don't fret because there's still shooting stars to see. Even after the peak uh, night, there's lots to see. So again, welcome everyone. I'm the Night Sky Guy, Andrew Fizekis. Whether you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, or, or Twitch, uh, thanks so much for joining in. We talk every week about the night sky, easy things, things that you can see, even if you don't do much stargazing, if you haven't before, uh, you're not really uh, savvy about everything that's up, up in the sky, that's okay. That's not the point. The point is just to go out five, 10 minutes, maybe pick out a few things that you see me talking about in this video that you can go out and try. Uh, 10, 15 minutes outside uh, in your front yard, backyard, maybe you're taking a walk, you'll be able to see some really cool things. And one of the big things this week is the Leonid meteor shower. So what is a meteor shower? Well, a meteor shower is when you have a small sand grain sized pebble from space that's been floating around in space, but there is a cloud of them that Earth slams into. Now these are left behind usually by comets. They're debris clouds left behind by comets. So if, if you can imagine the, uh, the, you've got the sun at the center of the solar system and you've got a comet, zipping around, coming close, attracted by the sun's gravity well. The, the, the comet, which is the head of the comet, is really made up of, is, uh, of mostly ice and dirt, all mixed together, frozen together. It's like a giant, dirty snowball. Comes close to the sun. As it does, it speeds up and it starts melting. And all as that ice is melting, it's letting um, go, basically releasing a lot of that dirt, those particles. Some, most of them are the size of a grain of sand. Some of them are bigger, like baseball, basketball size stones. But most of them are sand grain size, and they get deposited in a cloud behind the comet that sort of mimics the same orbit around the sun, all those clouds of debris. Every time the comet comes close to the sun, it releases another of these clouds. And if that happens over thousands or millions of years, you can imagine there's a lot of these clouds, streams of this material that's uh, in orbit around the sun, just like the Earth is. Now for the Leonids, every November 16th, 17th, we hit the densest part of this cloud of debris. And this one is left behind by a, a, a comet called Temple Tuttle. And the last time it was here was in 1998. And uh, the next time, I think it will be in 2031, that the next time the comet is here. But we see bits and pieces of that comet rain down in our skies. And we call those the Leonid shooting stars or meteors. So each meteor streak of light that you see burning up in the atmosphere, that's, a, that's that little particle hitting the atmosphere and burning up. So how much can you expect? Maybe 10 to 15 shooting stars per hour is what you can expect. So if we move over to our uh, planetarium sky, here I've got it set up for Monday, November 16, 17. And you can see early in the evening, if we go into um, just after 
uh, sunset, you'll notice first off, if you're a keener and you're going out right after sunset, what you'll see first is you'll be greeted to uh, a moon, a very ultra thin crescent moon. Okay. And that this is on Monday, November 16th, ultra thin crescent moon with Jupiter and Saturn uh, really pinning down the southwest skies in the early evening. Now, the moon will be lost very quickly in, uh, in the glare of the sunset, so you don't have much time to see the moon, and you need a very clear view to the, um, to the uh, um, southwest uh, sky. A clear view to the southwest sky is what you are looking for. Okay, so uh, that's the setup for uh, the southwest sky on Monday evening. And then you'll see if you're looking towards the uh, southeastern sky and we move all the way over, you'll see a bright beacon, which is Mars. Mars is going to be shining there. Now, to begin to see the shooting stars, however, it's best to wait later at night. So the skies will darken. And if we flash forward into the night, the stars begin to come out. Those constellations that you see, these are all mythological figures. Of course, you don't see the, the figures in the sky, just the, the stars that make up these different uh, mythological ancient figures. Um, some are beasts, some monsters, some are queens and kings and heroines, all kinds of really neat soap opera-like stories in the sky. And what's very interesting is that the, uh, the Leonids really begin coming up later, much later. We're talking about, well, this is already 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And look at that. You'll see here later at night, the moon is long gone, right? The moon is going to be long gone out of the sky because it's following the sun. It will have set, the moon will have set shortly after sun, sunset. You know, within the first hour after sunset, it's gone, even the glare of the moon. So that's great for watching meteors. You'll see a lot more meteors. And, you know, I have to say that one of the big things about shooting stars is you need dark skies. The better your sky conditions, the more meteors you see. Even the fainter ones will be visible. Now, even if you're in city limits, you'll see some shooting stars. Not the most. You won't see the utmost number of shooting stars, but you'll still see some because it's a meteor shower. Some will be brighter than others. So stay tuned. Even if you're in a big suburb somewhere, you'll see some of this Leonid meteor shower show. So um, getting back to our sky, you can see that there is, if you look at the shooting stars in this uh, animation, you'll see that they seem to be coming out from the northeastern sky. So if you face towards the northeast, again, Monday night, into Tuesday morning this week, you'll be able to start seeing what we call the radiant of the meteor shower. So get this, guys. So when you trace back those individual shooting stars, those streaks of light, and you trace them back, where do they seem to come from? Each one will appear to be coming from one part of the sky. And as that, uh, that uh, uh, as we go later at night, near midnight and one o'clock in the morning, we see what that radiant is. Where do they appear to be radiating out from? The constellation Leo the Lion. Now, if those of you that have been with me for a long time, you know that Leo the Lion is a constellation that is easily visible in the evening sky. What time of the year? Spring. So springtime is when you get to see uh, uh, the um, Leo constellation very conveniently located in our skies in the evening. So that's March, April, May, is the best time to see an evening. But this time of the year in November, Leo rises very late at night or early in the morning. So right after around midnight, one o'clock in the morning is when it rises above the, your local horizon. Now, what's particularly interesting now with the Leonids is that's where it gets its name. That's the namesake of the Leonid meteor shower. They appear to be radiating out from this one part of the sky called the Leo constellation. That's why they're called the Leonids. And so the higher in the sky, the Leo constellation, the radiant of the meteor shower gets, the better the view uh, you will get. So you really have to get the, that coffee brewing if you want to see and, and, and stay up late at night to see all of the show. It doesn't mean you have to. You can see uh, some of the, the meteors uh, falling uh, you know, 10, 11 o'clock your local time, midnight local time, but around midnight and beyond is when it really starts kicking in. And with no, me no moon in the sky, it's really uh, 
uh, this this uh, this is really a great a great chance to to see stuff. So Kathy says it's her birthday month, um, and Cam says greetings from Saskatoon. Great of you to join us, Cam. Uh, it definitely saw the launching. Yeah, that's right. We'll talk a little bit about uh, Space Station in a few minutes too. So stay tuned for that. So um, what's really neat here is you get the Linus. How many are you going to see? If you've got a dark sky, expect to see somewhere between 10 and 15 shooting stars per hour. So that's in the overnight period say from 10 p.m. local time where you are until about 4 a.m. local time uh, the following morning, Tuesday morning. So in that time period, in the overnight period, 10 to 15 shooting stars per hour. Remember, these are remnants from the, the, the comet Temple Tuttle that last time made an appearance in 1998 and won't come around again until the year 2031, but we see the debris left behind every time it comes close it lets go a lot of this material. It sheds material into space. These clouds of, of debris is what Earth slams into, and that those little uh, grains, uh, sand grain-sized particles burn up in the upper atmosphere at very high speeds. We're talking about 150,000 kilometers per hour, and that's what causes that shooting star, that little streak of light that we call a meteor or a shooting star. And that's what the Leonids is all about. So don't miss out. Make sure you bundle up. It's per, uh, perhaps maybe lie back. One of the things that you can do is lie back on a, on a reclining lawn chair. You kind of want to get uh, a good, uh, comfortable view of the overhead sky. You don't want to get a kink in your neck by looking up like this. You want to kind of lie down on a reclining lawn chair somewhere. Get comfortable and you'll be able to see a lot more shooting stars. So uh, get set to make a lot of wishes with the Leonid meteor shower peaking Monday, November 16th into the early morning hours of November 17th. And this is visible right across the world. Maybe perhaps the Northern Hemisphere is fav favored a bit with this one uh, because it's emanating from the Leo constellation. But I think it's going to be visible pretty much anywhere around the world as long as you've got clear or partly clear skies. And one more thing before I leave the Leonids, be prepared to see fireballs. Fireballs are these golf ball, baseball, basketball size stones, much bigger than the sand grain size. And as you could imagine, when they burn up in the atmosphere, these larger stones make more unusually bright meteors, right? So these are gonna be much more spectacular. They're gonna be uh, looking like they have a smoke trail associated with them. Some even rarely cause a sonic boom. Imagine that, that I haven't, I've never experienced, but I've heard that is possible uh, with these. Uh, you can even see them breaking up. Some of them even land, and we pick them up as meteorites. Very, uh, very exciting for scientists in those, uh, those aspects because these are like sort of uh, cosmic archaeological uh, you know, fragments from uh, the ancient, most ancient part of our, our solar system's existence. I mean, remember, comets are basically some of the leftover remains of the as building blocks of planets so stuff that didn't make up our uh, to be co uh, sort of come together to form our planets the leftover material became asteroids and we have also comets left over so really they're some of the most ancient materials these meteors that are streaking across our skies and so that they end their life in a in a fraction of a second something really cool to think about. And remember that comets in science have been very uh, important because we think comets might have brought uh, water to our planet. Imagine that, the water that we see, all the oceans and lakes and such, that water may have originally, billions of years ago when Earth was very primitive, it, the impacts, there were a lot more comets around, fl floating around in, in the solar system. The impacts of those giant dirty snowballs made, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, redid the, 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 the look and feel of our planet uh, and the terrain and deposited a lot of potential water that was, of course, a key ingredient for life on our planet. So something really exciting in terms of science uh, when we're talking about comets and in this case, the debris of comets in the form of the Leonid meteors that are falling uh, in the skies above. So uh, this is really interesting. Pa Pam, Pam's asking, how do long does the shower last? Seconds? No. So we're talking in the over, actually Leonids are visible for a couple of weeks, but there's, you only see like 
you know, maybe two or three shooting stars that are associated with Leonids per hour on any average night over the course of the next week or so. If we go beyond Monday or Tuesday, like by the end of this week, you'll only see a few, a real trickle uh, left over as we head out of this debris cloud. But, uh, you know, you can really see some really good uh, activity over the course of the entire evening, Monday night into Tuesday morning. So at rates of 10 per, per hour or 15 per hour, you could see, you know, we're talking about, you know, easily, uh, you know, 80 to 100 shooting stars over course of a night, perhaps. So try to find a good spot that's clear with clear skies or partly clear skies, even if you're stuck in the city. Look for those fireballs. They're really, really cool. So, Pam, thanks a lot for that uh, that question. Um, so, um, uh, so there's a lot to see with the Leonids. Now, if we move on, what else is there to see? Um, uh, the other big thing that is really worth looking at is, of course, uh, Mars. Mars is, uh, as I've said, is something that's really a, a beauty of a site. So, if we just go a little bit earlier, and this is, let's say, on Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night we look at Mars on uh, Wednesday, uh, look at what this is, Wednesday the, uh, the 18th, Mars is gonna be high in the southern sky late in the evenings. Beautiful, and while Mars was in opposition in October, about a month ago, when opposition is when it's its biggest and brightest, Mars is still shining super bright in our sky. So you don't wanna really miss it, and Mars is getting fainter and smaller in telescopes as the days and weeks move on from that peak time in mid-October when it was in opposition. So that means for sky watchers like you and me, now is still a very good time to get a view of Mars. And what's very interesting is if you look at Mars through a telescope, then you get to see some really interesting things. So check this out. So if we look at Mars in the skies, this is where it is high in the southern sky right now. That's where we'll, we'll be able to see it. And if we zoom in on Mars uh, through a small backyard telescope, you begin to see stuff. So as I'm zooming in, to mimic what a, a backyard telescope will show, this is what you'll see, is a small disk, okay? And you'll see some bright features and dark features. And you'll, the dark features are the windswept rocky highlands of Mars, while the, the brighter patches are the deserts of Mars, the iron oxide rich sand dunes and dusts of Mars that's completely covering the planet. So it's, it's something really neat to see. Uh, here is, okay, <laughs> the eyes, not events. Okay, this is interesting. And Emily, what do you have to say there? I say, I saw Mars a few days ago and it was super, Jupiter and Saturn too. Exactly, exactly, Emily. They are, planets are some of the most amazing things to see. Even if you're very new to sky watching and you don't have any equipment other than your eyes, there's a lot to see. So Mars is really cool. Getting to see that difference in the in uh, in uh, the disk of Mars of the different regions of Mars. And if you look very closely at the bottom of the of the the world is a small white patch. That's the southern pole, the ice cap of Mars, and it's frozen carbon dioxide just sitting there in the southern polar cap. Again, this is a feature that's just visible through backyard telescopes. So you can get a small backyard telescope and see features like that. To the naked eye, meanwhile, Mars shines as a brilliant orange colored beacon and you don't wanna miss it because right now is the best time to view it. So again, this is Wednesday night, look for Mars, high in the southern sky. And guess what, if you want a little bonus next to what we've talked about before, you've got the great square of Pegasus, the flying horse, right up next to Mars, above right of Mars. It's this big square-like feature that's made from four, you know, sort of medium bright stars that are visible even, th even through some moderate light pollution, something that you can see. Uh, and so you're getting to know the night sky. See, every week we talk a little bit more about different things in the sky and uh, you'll get to know it a lot more. Now, let's flash forward to Thursday, November 19th. Uh, this is going to be interesting because we've got, uh, and I want to go to the sunset. We're going to set it to the sunset, and we are going to see here, not the 20th, but the 19th, the 19th of November. So here we are, the 19th of November, soon after sunset, look for 
the moon, the beautiful, stunning crescent moon, um, joining Saturn and Jupiter. They'll, it'll form kind of a, a real squished triangle formation. And this is something just beautiful. Look, it's going to be in the south, southwestern part of the sky. You won't be able to miss it because Saturn and Jupiter are super bright stars. So something that, um, uh, something very easy to see. Uh, very easy to see just with the naked eye. If you have binoculars, oh my gosh, what a beautiful view. So here's something like what a, a pair of binoculars will show a, a view similar to this. So imagine that, just beautiful. So the fainter one in between here, the next closest to the moon is Saturn. Saturn, of course, is the uh, Lord of the Rings. If you have a small telescope, you need a small, a binocular won't quite quite do it, but a small telescope will reveal, look at that, the rings of Saturn. You can see, see still the day glow here. We're kind of at sunset, so it's not totally dark, but those rings will pop through with a small telescope. Amazing to see that. And then if we zoom out again and to the far right of the moon will be the brightest star. So you'll know you'll, you, these are easy to find, these two stars, the fainter one, Saturn, um, and Jupiter, wow, it'll knock your eyes out. Jupiter is going to be right there, uh, easy to see. Now, as we get um, later, I'm going to set this so that we're getting a skies that are darkening. And the moon and Jupiter are, and Saturn, that trio, is heading towards sinking towards the southwest sky. But what's very cool is as we're heading later, I'm just going through as, as the minutes pass. This is after 5 p.m. local time. Uh, we're getting closer to the horizon. Now, remember, wherever you are watching this, you are, this is set for mid-northern latitude, so about halfway to between the equator and the North Pole. I'm in Montreal, Canada, so these this sky is set for mid-northern latitudes, which is good for a lot of the major cities like New York, uh, you know, Seattle, Washington, Rome in Italy, London, England. All of these areas would have a similar sky condition. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it's going to be oriented very differently from what I'm seeing, but these trio will be visible together. They'll still hang around together. They'll just be oriented a little bit differently. So here we are, uh, later, they're sinking, getting closer to the horizon. But what I want you to look at is Jupiter is going to be very, very cool to look at through binoculars and telescopes. Now check this out. So if we zoom in on Jupiter, Again, this is around centered around 7 o'clock, 7.30, your local time. This is, again, on November 19th, Thursday. The moons of Jupiter are going to be playing hide-and-seek. Now, what do I mean by that? So if we look at uh, the moons, here we'll see, close up through a backyard telescope, you'll see this moon called Callisto. Here, I'm going to zoom in some more, right in front of the face of of Jupiter. Isn't that incredible? You'll actually see one of the big four moons. Now there's Jupiter. Now you have to remember Jupiter has four main moons. Okay. So I'll set the scene for you. Uh, these four main moons were first seen by Galileo in 1609 through a very primitive newly invented telescope, which is no more really more powerful than a strong pair of binoculars that we have today. And he noticed four little dots hanging around Jupiter's disk. That is what we know as the four Galilean moons. They're the four largest moons. Jupiter has dozens of moons. But the four largest ones that are visible through even binoculars, get that, even binoculars you could see it. It's surprising but true that these four are visible. But on, on, um, on November 19th, Thursday night, the moons, you know, you have to remember, these moons move around Jupiter, right? They orbit Jupiter, and sometimes they're in, they go in front of it. And Callisto, one of the moons of Jupiter, will be right in front of the disk of, of Jupiter, while another one around 7.30, coming out of the shadow of Jupiter, will be Ganymede, is another of the four moons. Now, if you have... Binocular. This is, again, with a telescope. You can see Ganymede coming out of the shadow easily and Callisto superimposed in front of the disk of Jupiter. And then to the far left of Jupiter is the moon Io, 
which is, by the way, the most volcanic body in the solar system. It has over 400 active volcanoes. Imagine. And you can see that with a pair of binoculars. Isn't that great? <laughs> and then uh, uh, on the right side of Jupiter will be Europa. It's an ice-covered, kind of like a giant ice cue ball that's cracked. And we think it's covering salty oceans underneath that may hold the promise of primitive life floating in that ocean that's covered with that ice sheet. That's what Europa is like. And guess what? You can see that with your binoculars and small telescopes. So here we are. You've got Io, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa all visible through a small telescope, while Io and Ganymede and Europa will easily be visible with binoculars. This is, again, no, uh, November 19th, Thursday night, is when all this action is happening. So you want to see this. This is so amazing. It's the celestial mechanics of the solar system playing out before your eyes um, on Thursday night, watching all this action happen around Jupiter, low in the southwest sky on Thursday night. And the moon will be there guiding you. Isn't that beautiful? I think this is going to be one of the most beautiful sights uh, for, for this week, too. You know, on top of the Leonid shooting stars, I think this is something that should be on your bucket list. Try to see it with binoculars or a small telescope. This is the time to try something new with it. Now, Again, I'll be putting up sky charts for this like I always do. So don't fret. There'll be uh, stuff coming out with that for sure. So let's move on to one more thing. Uh, one, There's always one more thing. Uh, on the weekend, we had the launch of the Dragon capsule uh, with the SpaceX Falcon 9 blasting it off into space. Four astronauts. Uh, going to the International Space Station. They're set to arrive late Monday night Eastern time. I think around 11 p.m. Eastern time is when they will be docking. I recommend you watch that. I'll put a link to that on my Facebook uh, channel, uh, definitely, a NASA link. And you can go ahead and watch that. It's really impressive watching it actually docking, the two spacecrafts. But guess what? You can actually see the International Space Station for yourself. And I wanted to give you a quick little uh, tip on how you can do that easily from the comforts of your own home. So uh, there's a really good website that I like to use. Uh, it's called heavens-above.com. And I'm going to show that right now. I'm going to move um, uh, this off and show you the website directly. There we go. So that's what you're looking for. Heavens-above.com is what it's called. And uh, it shows you all the major bright satellites. I'll put a link, don't worry, in the comment section below. So you'll go directly there and do this. And this is just a quick tutorial on how to go about looking for the International Space Station. So what you do is you basically have to tell it where you're watching from. So you basically go to, uh, you can see it says, change your observing location up here. You click on that link, it gives you a big map. And this is the easiest. Now, what you do is you find on the map of the world where you are and you put a pin there. And so I've put a pin in mine uh, for Montreal, Canada. This is where I'm located in the world. And so once that's done, at the bottom here, it says update. There's a little link. You can see I got my cursor there. So you cl click on update. And now it's now specifically for your location. In this case, it's Montreal. And then here in satellites, you can see there's a whole bunch of satellites here that are listed. You look for ISS. And there's ISS. So I click on ISS. And what it will give me is all the visible passes in the overhead, the flybys of the International Space Station above my location. So you can choose visible only here. There's a little button there that you, you click on. And then here you see all the dates, November 18th through November 25th. It kind of gives you over a little bit over a week or two weeks of, of possible viewing times. And it tells you how bright it is. The larger the negative number, the brighter it is. And it tells you the start time, when you can start seeing it in your local time for your time zone, and then the highest point of where it's visible and where it finishes. So what you're looking for, when you're looking for a to see the space station, it'll look like a moving star in your sky above you. So it's not going to be blinking. 
Don't look for a blinking star. That's probably a, 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 a plane. Uh, it's a steady white light, no colors, just a white light that moves silently across the sky. So it's, it looks like a star moving across your sky. It takes about two to four minutes to travel across the sky. It's fast. It's moving at about 28,000 kilometers per hour or about 17,000 miles per hour. So imagine that's, that's the speed of the space station. It takes only 90 minutes to go once around our earth. So it orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes. So that means that you could potentially have more than one chance to see the space station. And remember, when you're seeing the space station, you're seeing it because light, the sunlight, the sun is still shining above where the satellite is. And the space station orbits at around 380 to 400 kilometers above our heads. So where it may be dark where you are, the sun has set and it's already night where you are, it's still shining the sun up where the satellite is, where the space station is, and the sun is reflecting off that very, very reflective uh, metallic surface, the solar panels on the space station, very reflective of the sunlight. And that's why you see it so bright. And so it's amazing to think that here you have all of the dates, and if you click on a date, all right, so let's say I click on uh, here you can see the first one. It says I'm visible at 1800 hours, 17 minutes. I can start seeing it about 10 degrees above my horizon. And that's in the southern uh, compass direction, right? And in the south. And then in, in a minute, it'll be at its highest. So if I want to see this, what it looks like in the chart, there's the chart. It even makes a chart for you. Look at that. And it shows you where it is. There it is at the bottom here. So this isn't necessarily like the best viewing for me in location wise, but there it is. You can see the track and how far into the sky you will see it at that time. So this is something you can print out. It's really, really cool. And look, you have it for, I have it for all the different times. So like for me on the 22nd of November, uh, is a very good one because it goes 65 degrees above my local horizon. So on the 22nd of November, this will be going up almost into the overhead part of the sky, very close, high up in my sky uh, in the southwest. I'll be able to see it. So just a very quick tutorial for you guys on what to expect with heavens-above.com. Really good website. I'll put a link below here so you can check it out, play with it. Figure it out. It may take you a little while to figure out. No problems. Uh, send me some questions if you want. I'll see if I can help you. But it's really easy to use, and it gets you going in terms of the International Space Station. Um, so uh, it's really say. And then Kimberly here is saying you should really watch the docking tonight. It's amazing. It truly is. We're living in amazing times, Kimberly. We can see people hundreds of kilometers above our heads in space, uh, really doing something historic. Uh, moving the needle in terms of uh, humanity's expansion into deep space. Uh, and we'll be going to the moon and off to Mars and who knows where else uh, into the universe uh, in the years and decades to come. So uh, this is really cool. Heavens-above.com. I'll put a link in the section below, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, I'll have it there. And of course, sky charts for everything that I've talked about. So thanks so much for joining me. It was It's a jam-packed week, isn't it? I mean, I can't believe it. We've got the Leonids to start off with. We've got the uh, Mars uh, at, at still a really good viewing. We've got a triangular formation of the moon with Jupiter and Saturn. We've got Jupiter actually playing peekaboo with its moons. How cool is that? And then we've got the International Space Station to watch above our heads. Uh, and if you can, share with your friends and family. It's awesome. So if you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel. Make sure you hit that notification button so you don't miss my next video. Uh, thanks so much for watching. I hope you uh, are staying safe and healthy. And until next time, of course, as always, I wish you clear skies. Bye-bye.